Good afternoon, ISR. How are you all? <laughs> um, I am so excited to be here today. I'm new to the University of Michigan, um, and I just want to first shout out uh, my research mentor, Dr. Daphne Watkins from yeah. the Curtis Center. Mm -hmm. I came to Michigan about eight months ago or so in June, and my first thing that I did when I came here was I attended ICPSR. And so I'm just so happy to be back in the room that has been providing so much great methodological um, empowerment and uplift, but also to be at ISR, where I think throughout the course of my presentation today, you'll see that a lot of the foundations and what I'm hoping to advance further have been generated here. And so, of course, um, today we'll be talking about Dr. Martin Luther King, but the title of my presentation is actually Unpacking Risk and Resilience in Urban Black Emerging Adult Men, a Quantitative Intersectional Analysis. And so many of us know Dr. King from uh, his I Have a Dream speech. And I know that today we will be talking about my dream for um, stronger trajectories to well being and resilience for Black men. Uh, but more so than Dr. King's words um, in his I Have a Dream speech. My work is really drawn on Dr. King's movement from a theologian to an interdisciplinarian, uh, something that I hope that we all as a field will consistently move from just our kind of silos oftentimes in our discipline to really understanding the breadth and the context of the things that are affecting all of the outcomes regarding health that we're interested in. So here you'll see a photo of Dr. King when he's graduating from Morehouse College when he is really a theologian, but then he takes this huge leap across his lifespan to really start to begin to understand how prejudice and religion and capitalism um, all really start to meld together to shape these disparity trajectories that we see that our speakers before have kind of outlined so clearly. And so hopefully today we'll take you through a little bit of a walk, not only through my work from student to scholar, um, but also through what some of my hope is for this work that I've been working on for about the past six or six to seven years. <clears throat> And so personally, I did not begin in academia. And so oftentimes people talk about academics and because I'm young, some people like, oh, you just went straight through school. And uh, for me, it was like, no, there was a little bit more that built this over time. And so I'm from New York. And so I've been studying black manhood since I was a child, just by being a part of these environments that have kind of cued me to seeing not only my development, but my development in context of my peers' development, my context, my development in terms of how my trajectories were different than those who were close to me, but then even more so opening up Pandora's box when I went to Howard University as an undergrad. Because the narratives that I heard oftentimes in the environment about black men didn't really look like my community. And then when I got to Howard, they definitely did not adhere to the diversity of men that I saw at the university. And so at first I said social policy is the way, government is the way, and I actually started work um, at the Export Import Bank of the United States, a very small federal agency that does export policy. But there I saw the power of policymakers and researchers to build the narratives that we use to make our policies in the country. And so after that, I said, OK, well, the policy thing was nice, but maybe I should be in the field talking to people, shaking hands, really learning if the disparities that I'm seeing in my mind and the way that the research and the things that I'm learning in academia don't always align with my personal world. I decided to go into the field. And so I joined uh, President Obama's 2012 campaign in Nevada and then Cory Booker's Senate special election. And so I say all that to say, my work is not necessarily just driven towards understanding the disparities, but how do we move from a disparity to a translational space where we're actually taking the knowledge that we have and we're putting it into the environment to really shape the lives of young black men. And I think here the knowledge from uh, PRBA, NSAL, so on and so forth over the years has laid an immense trajectory for that. But now I think it's time for us to take another step, right? And so when I left the university, I decided to go into lobbying. Um, so I was the Pennsylvania State Outreach Director for Students First, a nonprofit that if you know anything about DC, you know about Michelle Reed, you'll just know that I got out of there as fast as I possibly could. Um, and what I realized there was that there were a lot of, as we know, well-intentioned advocates in the youth development and education space. And as I was sitting there, I said, well, they don't really know what they're talking about because they don't, and meaning that they weren't living the life that I was living, but they were writing policies for young men who looked like me, but I didn't either. And so I said, let me take a step back from policy to pursue my master's at the University of Pennsylvania, where I worked under Dr. Howard Stevenson. But there, I started to really pick up this notion that intervention in research is a thing. 
right? It's not just about looking at things on a piece of paper and being able to interpret them and have scholars who have brilliant minds who really can contextualize and explain the processes that we see, but also that we can do something about this in real time and we don't have to wait until the 30th year of a longitudinal study to actually be able to do that all the time. Uh, and so I got my PhD in human development after studying education, culture, and society. And now I'm here at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. So at the core of this problem that I've been having um, over time is that much or very often in society, we see these very polarized narratives of Black men. So we see them as victims, we see them as criminals, and then we even see the commercialization of their success um, to bring these larger narratives around funding, philanthropy. But in all actuality, we really see that young Black men experience what we call a precarious emergence, right? That generally, they do not have a space in our society where they are securely held, right? That they are very likely to not have the opportunity to be resilient, to fall into risk categories primarily because the supports are not there to ensure their healthy development. And we as a field, I think, still have to come together to decide what that trajectory, what that blueprint really looks like. And so why do I call it a precarious emergence? Well, unfortunately, um, at the ages of 18 to 30 years of age, we see a rapid accrual of risks for young Black men. Um, and it's funny because when I was in graduate school, I mostly was looking at adolescents. And then once they got out of school and they weren't in a college setting, we had no research on black men from their perspectives that was really looking at the things that were critical for their reach for their development over time. And so the thing that was most alarming to me at first was the increase in black male incarceration at the age of between 18 and 30 years of age. And then the fact that the correctional population in the United States was predominantly consisting of young black men. But as I thought about this from a contemporary lens, I said, there, this can't be new, right? This has to be something that we've seen over time, especially if it's concentrated at this developmental stage. And so I went to the literature, um, the literature from Du Bois specifically. And I was in graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. So I said, well, the data I'll be using is from Philly. So let me find out what Du Bois had to say early about these experiences for young black men. And so we see the similar patterns, right, in terms of incarceration, in terms of the convicts in the penitentiary. And so obviously the environment perceives young black men as risky. They perceive them as threatening. But at the same time, it's not necessarily clear why these disadvantages are accruing at this life course stage, right? And so we have these really interesting, um, you know, kind of litany of things that's going on here. But this was really driven by my own personal experience. Um, so being from New York um, across my life course, um, I've seen a number of really challenging things in this public sphere. Um, but then it really started to hit home first when Mike Brown was, uh, um, was killed. Um, and then also my cousin who actually was incarcerated, he got out of jail and maybe about six months after was shot dead in Maryland. Um, and then his brother, um, who was actually just released from jail very recently, but followed a similar trajectory. And then my younger stepbrother, actually, um, when he was suffering mental health challenges in New York, they took him to Rikers and then they wound up, um, what wound up killing him. And so the fact that all of these things are accruing, I said, I need to understand what's going on with boys and young men of color, both in the context, as well as what's going on in their everyday lives. And so, yes, we've had this very interesting development over the course of the past few years where we see a lot of work around boys and young men of color. Tons of money is being thrown into the philanthropic space to support boys and young men of color, specifically the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has a Forward Promise initiative. However, when we look at the literature, there are a number of gaps. And so we're pouring money into an enterprise at this point in time where we know funders are fickle um, in terms of <laughs> what, what outcomes they would like to see. Uh, but we haven't really addressed certain gaps in our own research that would actually allow us to use those funds appropriately, especially when we know that they're not coming necessarily from the federal government. They're coming from private organizations that want to see outcomes relatively quickly. And so some of the major issues were that we really weren't taking an intersectional look at Black men. Right. We were doing race or gender comparative work. So we have a lot of uh, work here at the university on black racial identity, but it wasn't necessarily considered in the context of masculinity intersecting with that or femininity intersecting with that. Um, but then we also have a lot of college enrolled or educated samples. 
And the majority of African American, the majority of the United States is not college educated. And so if context matters in the way that we understand people's behaviors, then the literature that we have available does not really speak to the experiences of uh, black men who are not enrolled in college. And then finally, a lot of the work that we're doing is very, it focuses on linear. We use a lot of regression-based approaches. And to an extent, that assumes homogeneity within a certain category. If you just fall at a certain place on a spectrum from one to five, without thinking about, well, how might another one of your characteristics actually alter the outcome based off of the different dimensions of inequity or marginalization that you experience. And also people not really thinking about masculinity as a risk factor, meaning that um, engaging in hegemonic masculinity as a risk factor for black men, not that they want to do it, but that the social context actually provides that as a way for them to survive and then winds up having much more risk outcomes in the end, at the end of the day. And so our key challenges around this are, um, one, that there's this sparse research. There's also a limited preparedness of youth advocates, teachers, so on and so forth, to address this. Um, and really, that we don't have a unified plan for, life, uh, for the lifespan development of Black men. And so this is what I present as something called the kaleidoscope vision, where we see all these beautiful things, all this beautiful research that's happening on Black men, programs, philanthropic efforts. And you see it, and it looks great, but then in actuality, it's fragmented, right? It's not really a cohesive, gelled picture. And you can't, it actually obscures your vision towards the problem. And so having all of these different pieces really said to me that we are, um, like Ellison often said, are distorted and fragmented. And Ellison puts it so beautifully. He says, I'm invisible, you see, simply because people refuse to see me. And he talks about hard, distorting glass shaping the way that people see Black men. And each of our individual lenses, in some way, is a reflective mirror. Right, But it doesn't necessarily help us to form a holistic perspective. And so generally, it looks like, in my opinion, this. Right, And my goal in my research is actually to move it from this to this. And so the core, pro core research program question that I have are one, how can we understand within group diversity among black men in order to develop targeted interventions? And then how do we prepare and sustain male educators and mentors of color to support those men? And so we'll get into the research now. And I'm giving you this broad level because I, my study, interestingly enough for my dissertation, I got a lot of pushback from my advisors because um, I studied four domains of outcome. Because in my mind, if identity is central to the way that people navigate the world, then yes, understanding what's going on in depression or what's going on in sexual health risk or what's going on in substance use individually may be nice, but isn't it a much more robust picture if we understand how the same group of men are experiencing all of these challenges so that we have a more clear and focused viewpoint of what we can do? And so I'll go quickly through the next aspects of it, because I think most of you probably will get the importance of Black emerging adult or Black emerging adulthood for young men. But there is little research on emerging adulthood. So emerging adulthood actually has become a newer addition to the life course in the research, really the period between 18 and 30, whereas before we kind of used to bucket that with young adulthood or we bucketed it with adolescence. We've now started to parse it out. And really, the interesting aspect of emerging adulthood is that it really focuses on the fact that there are a lot of interpersonal and social aspects that shift dramatically for young adults as they move out of the somewhat protected space of adolescence into everyday life. And especially, um, Arnett and Brody argue that for emerging adults who are African American, this passage is what they call fraught. Meaning that because identity is a central piece of the transition to adulthood, that having a context that does not support your identity development is detrimental to your health. And oftentimes we look at identity development as a link towards other well -being, health well-being outcomes, when in all actuality, the synthesis of identity from the early literature on Erickson, so the ability to see yourself in this case as Black, and as male, and from an urban environment, and with a certain educational level, that synthesis is really what carries someone through the life course, not themselves feeling fragmented. And so just briefly, um, I think that it's interesting that Arnett and Brody really um, focus on the fact that these issues are especially acute for African-American emerging adults due to the injection of discrimination and prejudice 
And the reason why I highlight that is because oftentimes um, when I do my presentation, people will say, well, what about the context, right? What about the global? And that, that should be taken as an assumption of the work, right? The work is assuming that these men are in a precarious state because of where they are. And so I'm going to um, kind of just pass forward on that a little bit because I know that it's something that we'll be able to talk about in the panel, but the notion that we are removing the context from this is the opposite, completely the opposite of what we're doing here. And so this is um, Erickson's initial conceptualization of the life course. And so often um, today we've seen kind of this made by numbers or in the longitudinal, um, in, from the longitudinal lens. But really now we have this new, oh man, okay. This new and emerging aspect of the life course where focuses on experimentation and risk taking. So if we're worried about risk and resilience in young black men, we have to think about it from a developmental perspective. So risk taking is the way that one individuates. It's the second individuation aspect of the life course. Why is that important? Well, it's important because sometimes when we think about risky outcomes from, for young black men, we think about it as if there, we should have a zero baseline, right? That no risk should be occurring. But that doesn't allow us to actually recognize that risk taking is a major aspect of becoming an adult. And so oftentimes when we think about health disparities or health risk, it's not that there should be no risk taking happening. Is that the risks that are happening should be resilience inspired, right? They should be leading towards the ability for someone to, to thrive through different risky situations without faltering later on in life. And so it's absolutely necessary. And identity at its core is the critical psychosocial task. It is the organizing structure of self and it orchestrates our behavior. And so if we wanna understand the behavior of young black men, it's important that we focus on how their identity development processes are occurring. Typically, we have some really interesting approaches to race and gender. I'll scroll through them, but we know a lot about the fact that masculinity uh, leads to, or uh, hegemonic masculinities often lead to aggression and violence. But then conversely, we find that when a young person has a very high or positive racial identity, their outcomes are improved. So if we wanted high masculinity and high racial identity for black men, it might be a little bit of a paradox of outcomes because we want to impress upon young men the value of being a man, but also their racial identity. And what it winds up doing, what we'll see in a moment, is it actually winds up uh, putting them in more of a risky condition rather than a more nuanced or more holistic view of manhood and masculinity. And so we'll scroll through these. I think I've said enough about this. Um, but the last, the last aspect of this is that we often are also forgetting the, in, the importance of masculine gender role stress, that it's not just masculinity and it's not just racial identity, but it's also the stressors that occur. And so we finally get to intersectionality and black manhood. And so Lisa Bolek asks a really important question and she puts it in the form of a math problem. And she says, does black lesbian woman equal a black lesbian, black, black plus lesbian plus, plus woman, does it equal black lesbian woman? And the question in this case is, uh, for me is, does being an urban person, a black person, an emerging adult, an emerging adult man, does that lead to a full understanding of someone as an urban black emerging adult man? And my answer is no. <laughs> Mostly because intersectionality requires that we analyze the matrix of domination and respect the fact that people are lived social groups, right? And that we may not be comparing them. We may not even want to compare them to one another because knowing what's going on within the group might actually help us when we try to move to application, right? It might actually help us to understand who to target, what programs at, or what interventions or what treatments. And so, we know enough about intersectionality, I believe, um, drawing from legal and law studies, but our common approaches have been social determinist approaches, health disparities approaches, or interactive, where we're using regressions to kind of figure out how different social statuses interact each other, with each other. But Griffith advances it and says, no, well, let's take it a little bit further and just focus on how intersectionality can be applied to men. And here he says that it's not just race or gender, but it's race and gender that goes into someone's economic status, but also their exposures and their, their responses to stressors, which lead to health disparities or disparities in behavior. And he argues that we should take a life course development perspective that takes into account all of these different aspects. And so from the study that I'll present today, and I'll go through the findings because we'll have some time to talk about it, but I really wanted to apply a person-centered and multidimensional view of identity to understand if there were unique subgroups within a population of African-American men 
rather ideological subgroups, thinking about the way that they thought, thinking about the way that they would navigate the world, rather than saying all of these men should be the same or we're going to assume that because they're from the same context, they are the same. And so the first three, the, the three dimensions that we use were something called black male vulnerability salience, the awareness of a black man about how risky the world could be for him. We, don't, we can't assume for every black man that he has a high awareness or a low awareness of that, even if he lives in an urban environment. Then we have hypermasculine ideolo ideology endorsement or endorsement of hegemonic masculinity, recognizing that young black men, some endorse the values of hegemonic masculinity and some do not, and that we need to understand how these things are interacting with each other rather than just assuming that one per that every black man stands at a certain point on the spectrum. And then masculine gender role stress appraisal. And why is that? Because how many people have ever been in New York City? I'm from New York, anybody? So you know, sometimes people step on your shoes and train, and you have to make a decision in that split moment if you're gonna hit that person or not. If that stress of that person challenging your being is worth it or not. And what we found in the literature is that we all three of these things are what are in, informing black men's behavior every single day. And so I decided to explore sociodemographic differences, emotional risk differences, and for domains of risk taking, violence, sexual health, alcohol use, and drug use, um, primarily through something called latent profile analysis. And so this here is drawing on Margaret Spencer's phenomenological variant of ecological systems framework in which she posits that we have to look at someone's vulnerability level, their stress, and their coping processes in order to, within a group, understand patterned and diverse outcomes. And so how did I translate this? I took those same aspects and I looked at emotional risk, violence, sexual attitudes and behaviors, substance abuse, and alcohol use within one study. I know, I did a lot. <laughs> but we used some data from a barbershop project in Philadelphia, 597 heterosexual men, um, 18 to 24 years of age, most at an income below $20,000 and 61% unemployed. So we wanted to get a real community sample here. And so in applying this person-centered view, we developed the latent classes, we looked at our identity constructs, and then we really wanted to look at how these actually work towards the prediction of these outcomes. Are there subgroup differences in these outcomes? And so our results. The first question was, can there be heterogeneous subpopulations? The answer is yes. There were four heterogeneous subpopulations that we identified. Um, and those four heterogeneous subpopulations that we identified, um, I termed diffuse, balanced, strained, and distressed. And as you can see here, the distress profile was highest on all of the outcomes when compared to the rest of the group, with the diffuse being the lowest. Meaning that these are, relative to the rest of the group, how they fall on the dimensions of vulnerability salience, ideology endorsement, and stress appraisal. What we found was that they actually, the diffuse group was low across, high across, but then the interesting difference between balanced and strained was this moderate and high notion of endorsement of hypermasculinity. But the most interesting thing here were the percentages. Only 19% of the men were in the distress group, whereas the largest group was 371 of balanced and the diffuse group 27. You'll see why that's important in a moment. When we looked at the depression levels of these men, as you can see here, the distress group had the highest level of depression, but that was accompanied by the highest level of sensitivity to rejection, as well as the, higher, the lowest level of retaliation restraint. So them perceiving that they could stop themselves from hitting the person on the train who stepped on their shoes. Well, then how does this have, what does this have to do with uh, going beyond to their behaviors? Because we took a cognitive affective behavioral view here. And so we went first with, this is their affect. So the cognition part are how they view about their identity, their salience. But then this talks about how they're feeling in their everyday lives. Then we talked about violence. So we looked at physical fights, verbal arguments, and weapon use. And what did we find here? Again, the distress group had the highest level of physical fights, whereas verbal arguments and fights were not very different amongst those groups. But the strained group actually carried weapons the most frequently, had victimized someone with a weapon, or felt like someone was going to victimize them. And so now we start to see a more complex picture of these subgroups of men, and we also get to see how they're distributed across. Now, we find similar results with alcohol use, with the strained group having the largest, highest levels of alcohol use, 
And then substance use, with the distress group having the highest level of injected drug use and uh, drug misuse by the Texas Christian University scale. And finally, sexual health risk. Interestingly enough, the diffuse group and the strain group were the groups that we needed to be most concerned of in terms of they report in the diffuse group voted reported positive condom attitudes and pleasurability, but they were also the group who were most commonly having unprotected sex in the most risky ways. And so really what I'm trying to say here is that our understandings thus far are important, but they really don't paint a full view of what we can understand from the data that we currently have about the lives that young black men are leading. And so from the foundations that uh, have been presented to us here at ISR, PRBA, University of Michigan, there's just a lot more understanding that we can arrive at if we really think about young black men as intersectional. And so finally, my dream is really a blueprint for resilient black manhood. Um, Martin Luther King speaks clearly about the life <laughs> blueprint and the importance of the life blueprint as uh, every building has a good foundation. And it, at that foundation, it has to be um, a good architect. It has to be a plan. And so ideally, um, I would like first for us to recognize the inherent issues with unidimensional or singular domain analyses, increase our interdisciplinary intentionality, build translational efforts to help, under, help everyday practitioners understand better young black men, and then finally, really develop a nationally implemented framework for young black men that acknowledges race, economics, and masculinity. Um, so thank you so much. Um, we are doing so much more of this work here, and I would love to talk to you about it in the future.